August 22nd, 2003, and we're interviewing uh, uh, General Delk. And uh, General, we were continuing with a, a time of some of the people that had been models for you and how different characteristics of their personalities and were things that you wanted to emulate. I, I took the demeanor of one person and uh, the um, uh, leadership of another and the dogmatism of another and, and the forcefulness of another and tried to put them together as I thought that they might be useful to me. How did that type of thing help you with the drawing? Well, it, it certainly helped. I was cautioned by, uh, I can't remember now whether it was uh, my uncle, uh, who was a flag officer, or my dad, one or the other, uh, and probably uh, my uncle, about uh, being yourself, and uh, you know we can we can look at uh, a Patton or somebody and uh, and and try to emulate that, and and that's very dangerous. And, uh, of course, I was counseled about that. So reach your own person, but uh, uh, I, I pointed out a couple of uh, giants in my, uh, my background, but, you know, all the way up from the, the sergeants to certain warrants, uh, all of them uh, have a role in shaping us. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and uh, again, you do see bad things. Mm -hmm. You see people that jump to conclusions. Uh, I can remember a senior officer who uh, uh, well he was not a man of character and you see things uh, like that and uh, so you learn good lessons and you also learn bad lessons and and uh, and uh, hopefully uh, uh, be all you can be when you get an opportunity yeah. to, to do your thing. Well, how did uh, you, as a major, and you're learning new, new strategies of survival and new strategies of, uh, of serving, and a whole new environment, and that's different bureaucracy than oh, a yeah. corporation uh, mm -hmm. business, and and uh, now you're, you're uh, somebody's looking after you, rather than finding a slot. How, how did that, uh, that next shot make? From the well, okay. well, f first of all, I wasn't there long. I was there, it seemed like a very, very short time as a training officer, a very, very short time after I came aboard as a full-timer when they gave me my own program and said uh, uh, they wanted me to take over the OCS program, which had its own staff, its own mission, its, 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 its own thing. <clears throat> with uh, a series of commandants, I was the full-time exec, and with a series of commandants, uh, and most of whom had something else to, to teach me. So I uh, went off in that direction, uh, and was enjoying that very much when, uh, and I don't know how the decision was made, and I never asked, probably should have. Uh, they asked me to take command of a mech battalion, and it was a very interesting mech battalion in that it was separate. It was a second battalion, mechanized, 185th Infantry, separate. It was a separate mech it battalion. It from any of the divisions. It was separate. As a matter of fact, its higher headquarters was an artillery group. They didn't know infantry, I didn't know artillery, so we didn't bother each other, which is, you know, can be good or bad depending on how you look at it. But the battalion was going into what they called OSD Test 3. And what they, uh, those series of OSD tests, Off Secretary of Defense tests, in the early 70s, they were exploring ways to improve readiness. And so uh, they would take uh, one outfit and give it more full time manning. They give another one and uh, uh, more extra training days. They give another one and they have mobile training teams and so forth. Our test involved an infantry and armor and an artillery battalion receiving extra help through mobile training teams out of the 4th Infantry Division in, in uh, 
course in Colorado. My battalion was to get no help. For each of these I had a control battalion. And we were suddenly off and running. And the battalion was uh, Central uh, California. It was uh, Modesto through Madera, uh, heavily Hispanic. Uh, and it, it was a new experience for me. And, uh, and, and, and we started off running. I mean, I no sooner reported, took over, when uh, they sent us down to Fort Irwin and put us through very arduous tests for a full two weeks to see you know, what we could do and what we couldn't. You didn't even know the unit yet. No. Although, under those circumstances, you, you learn them quickly. But, uh, and so, a benchmark, just how good we were or how bad we were. We were not very good. And, uh, and so then we, we trained like hell, and it was because we weren't getting any help, it was the competitive juices. And uh, it's amazing what that alone can do. And so uh, uh, we were tested a year later uh, uh, and compared to the ones that got all the help in the world, uh, those of us who didn't, and uh, kind of screwed up the test because we improved more than the other outfit. Uh, we were worse to start with, in fairness. But anyhow, uh, the soldiers were incredible, and um, we did well. Uh, Chief of the Bureau happened to come down towards the end, and uh, I was asked to give him a briefing. I hadn't been around long enough to know that I was supposed to be nervous. And so I gave him one of my better briefings. Well, anyhow, as a consequence of that, they quickly asked me to go to, to Bureau and asked me to uh, put together the unit readiness reporting system, a, a computerized system for the National Guard. And, and we started from scratch, and it was a, it was a great fun. Now, who, was the, who was the head of the National Guard Bureau that you made that report to? Uh, Vern Weber. Mm -hmm. and, he was uh, a three-star. Yeah. Uh, that was, before the I think that was later, mm -hmm. Bec because I think that happened so later on. He, so he basically, that was kind of a chance that you saw someone uh, and you briefed him, and he was impressed with your work. And they asked you to come back and work for him. Yes. Uh, and that made him move to D.C. Yes. Uh, that's a big change. Yes. Uh, and you, here you're out in Madeira in the farm country with a mechanized unit. That must have been a blast, though, to bring him up to the sun. Well, well, yeah, well, it was. Yeah. Yeah. Probably the best years of my life. That's fun, yeah. Yeah, you know, they're great soldiers. They did anything you asked, and uh, and they wanted to show the rest of those. <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, they really responded. You know, all you had to do was say, this is the way we ought to do it, and off they go. Yeah. And it was that? tough. It was tough. I mean, the red heat warning lights in all those vehicles were on all the time. Hotter in hell, we only had one heat casualty because uh, they stayed away from alcohol, drank their water, did all the good things, great soldiers. Now, Fort Irwin's a tough place. Oh, it is. Yeah, I was out there for just a, for a year, so I had, had a very distant feeling for what it would be like to sit in one of those damn tanks. Yep. <laughs> um, when you went to uh, MGB now, this is, uh, when would this have been? You were, you were still... Uh, 72, 73. And uh, you were still in the mechanized unit, that detached unit. Yeah. And you were asked to go back to NGB. Yes. In Washington. Yes. Um, did you make the decision instantly? Did you talk to Edna? Did you talk about it? What well, no, no. We, we, of course, we, we talked about it. Uh, and they had done some negotiating with uh, with General Turnage in advance. They probably asked him before they asked you. Oh, oh, sure, sure. And so he was prepared to say, you know, this could be good for you. You ought to do it. So I did, it was also good for California. We always thought it was good to get people back there. It was it was a uh, interesting and fun assignment because uh, they didn't have a readiness branch. So they, they took me back there and uh, and spent a little briefing time with me and said, uh, uh, organize yourself a branch. I'm gonna authorize you uh, two field grade officers, uh, one major, a secretary, and if you need more after you go to work, let me know. So we were designing our own office and figuring out what we had to do. And so you got a promotion along with it. 
No, at that time I was still lieutenant colonel. Uh, and I wasn't that senior lieutenant colonel. So anyhow, uh, we went back there and uh, hired the people, went to work, uh, immediately got in trouble uh, because of the bureaucracy. Not and, the bureaucracy. Well, what I had to do uh, it was we had to have design a manual to get it out to the troops. And he wanted us to do it fast. So I very quickly found out the way to do something fast is to put test after the title. So it was something like uh, FM, uh, I'm not even sure now it was an FM, but anyhow, I can do remember it started off 525 something paren T test. And uh, so we designed this thing and staffed it all very quickly. And then I went to the publisher and he printed them up. In the meantime, we were not in the Pentagon. We were clear out at Edgewood Arsenal in what they called uh, uh, Army Operations Center. It was kind of a, an annex of the Pentagon out of Edgewood Arsenal. And I got this summons to report to General Weber. So <laughs> I reported to General Weber. He's sitting here with this, this document in front of him. And you hadn't seen it yet? Oh, no, I'd seen it. But uh, it had just come off the press. And uh, he, had, he had a copy in front of him. And he says, um, it's an interesting document. He held it up and showed it to me. And, and I didn't know where this was all going. I was keeping my mouth shut. And he said, uh, you know, there's a way we publish things in the Army. And, and as he started talking about all these steps, which I had skipped. And, uh, and uh, he said, why'd you do that? And I said, sir, you told me you wanted it in a hurry. And I got it for you in a hurry. And uh, he said, yes, you did that, but, uh, you know, if we didn't have rules and didn't follow them, the Army wouldn't survive. He said, you agree with that? Yes, sir. And he kind of grinned at me to make it clear, and I've forgotten now exactly what he said, but what he in effect said was, I might have done the same thing also, but don't do it again. <laughs> and so, so I went out with, in the, my boxes of manuals were delivered, and we very quickly got everybody familiar with the unit readiness reporting system. Then uh, an, an interesting thing happened. I got a call from General, Tur oh, uh, General Turnage and a competitor of his had come in and taken over the Army Guard. And uh, he talked to me about going back into the division. And uh, the next thing I knew, I got a call saying, uh, we're gonna promote you to Colonel, 06. And I oh, gee, that's nice. And, and then I got another call from the state saying, uh, uh, we, we want you to take over the G1 for a while, lieutenant colonel slot, and then uh, probably later on you'll be chief. So I was actually promoted on paper as a colonel. I had to go back to Maryland and have them cancel all that out. Uh, and then uh, go transfer it out. And there was a, a lot of ill feeling at some senior levels there. I, I kind of got caught in the middle, didn't know what was going on. Well, it's hard because you're controlled from California, but you're working in Washington for different groups. Yeah, very hard to do. And that's when I went back and got in the division. So you and you were back. Uh, so how long were you were you in uh, at the Pentagon? At part? the Pentagon, something like a year and a half. It was not a long period, mm -hmm. just long enough to get that thing up and rolling. And you learned a lot, though. Oh, sure. Bureaucracy and all that. You always do. Yeah, yeah. That's a terrific, <laughs> yeah. terrific experience. Yeah. Uh, so then you, you came back and they put you in the same LTC slot, so you had to say no to no six and came back to Oklahoma. Yeah. As a G1 for the, for the uh, OTAG for, or for the division? No, the, the division. Uh, for 49th? 40th. For, so you came to 40th. Now they've been divided, so I'm yeah. chasing it. Back to the 40th now. Uh, and so where was it based then? Uh, Long Beach, Redondo, the Redondo Avenue Armory. Mm -hmm. Before it then we go to the south. Yeah. Uh, was there as a G1 f for a while, and then the chief of staff. So you moved. You moved from there, from uh, <coughs> directly then from Washington to uh, to Southern California. Um, and uh, so, how was your family taking all this transition? You've gone from Sacramento to back east now. Did your yeah. family have made the change with you? Oh sure. <coughs> Excuse me, but but it's a you know it's a tough goal for the family. Yeah. It really is, particularly when the kids get in high school. And, and now I was starting to move them around so often uh, they really didn't have a chance to get roots down. As, uh, 
the longest we were any place uh, for several times there was a, was about a year and a half. Mm -hmm. And we went down there for not much longer than that, uh, and were asked to go up to uh, the state again. And you were G1, the, the chief of staff of Fortis? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, who was head of Fortis at that time? Carnage. Mm -hmm. So he was head of Fortis at that time. And then so, um, and then you went back up to Sacramento. He got moved up there. Patterns beginning to develop here. Mm -hmm. He moved up there and then asked me to come up there. I see. So he, he, he identified you a long time before that as someone you could trust. And so you were serving with him. And what was your new position when you left as Chief of Staff at Fortis? I went up to become the state G4 and then Chief of Staff of the state. I see. Hold on, let me, let me digress. I forgot to ask. Uh, at Fortis, that's a whole other environment. Yes. Uh, this is a, uh, at that time it was like a fully mobilized unit, could be fully mobilized, and it was fully supported, and not strict as it has been with <laughs> the brigades and all. Um, how, and, and you've been, you've been in bureaucracies for a while, now you're back in a, in a, um, in a, in a fully, um, it's still a mechanized unit. Uh, full armored, I think, at that time, wasn't it? No, when I went in, it was mechanized. Okay. And, and how, how's the difference between I mean, G1 and Chief of Staff? That's a big responsibility for, what, 16,000 people or so? And, and they were, what, four or five states? Yeah, of course, the great majority were in, uh, were in California. We had, a, we had a, a little piece in New Mexico. Uh, later on, we had more pieces. But right then, as I remember, the only one we had was in, in New Mexico, Air Defenders. And so whatever else was in California. Yeah. So it was really a Summers division. Yeah. And how, how do you contrast that, uh, that kind of work that you were doing there? That's very different. Uh, well, you know, every, every, every experience was different. Uh, I was the, what they call the AO, the administrative officer, uh, as well as the TONE uh, title I had. So I was responsible for the full-time structure. Uh, Frankly, I found myself uh, being the, uh, the uh, bad actor for a while. Mm -hmm. People had to be fired. Uh, we had to do some disciplining. To get people up to stop. Yeah, we probably had to quickly fire uh, four or five people. I'm talking senior people. Mm -hmm. And that, that kind of thing is never pleasant, but uh, it has to be done in our business. Yeah, to, to bring the, uh, the division of that level of that urgency and that requirement and responsibility just to stop is a tough job. Uh, and so it, and I began to have a, a real uh, look of a professional organization at that time. So you were doing that clean house, you had been in attorneys moved up, so attorneys needed somebody to help do that. Uh, so when he went up, uh, he was really good for picking out people to do those kinds of jobs. He was very good. Well, he, uh, he had a, uh, he, he had high standards yes, he and insisted on them. Yes. <coughs> And, uh, and, and he knew who uh, he felt should be replaced. Now, there were a couple of cases that I didn't agree with him and, uh, and was able to, you know, sell him on taking a second look, but generally uh, I had to agree when he, he spotted somebody that needed to be replaced, he, he needed to be replaced. And uh, now you were, you were full, you were, I think you became colonel at that time. No, I was lieutenant colonel initially, mm -hmm. and then became colonel when uh, I became chief of staff. When did you go to, to War College? That was in 1979 uh, when I was Chief of Staff in the state. I went back to the War College, <clears throat> graduated class of 80, and uh, they asked me to stay on a couple of years there. I taught uh, uh, professional ethics, and most of my time I was involved as what they call a study manager for the Strategic Studies Institute there at the, at the War College which was a fascinating work. Yeah, I worked with the woman of the Institute of Land Warfare, and that's really fascinating. And it's a kind of an adjunct of the Institute of Study. How, how would, uh, because that is really a, um, a think tank, military think tank, how, yes. how did that, uh, now you're going to a whole different area, you're oh, applying yeah. all these things. How, how would you, a lot of research involved, uh, how would you? Well, well yeah. Um, First of all, it was my, my uh, 
the War College my first exposure to a lot of classified stuff. And then the studies we were doing were classified. The first one that they had me do was, I've forgotten the precise title, but in effect it was what should our relationship be with the uh, People's Republic of China mm -hmm. Army. And so, uh, that was a tough one. oh sure it was, and uh, it was a job given us by the uh, DESOPS of the Army, and there was a General Stillwell, Stillwell at that point who was a retired general, but who was very focused on the Orient, and so we knew we weren't, uh, we weren't going to walk into this one easy. So uh, I was given a couple of uh, lieutenant colonels, very bright guys, and uh, we put together a study plan. It involved us uh, talking to so-called sinologists, mainly here on the West Coast, and then uh, flying off to the Orient. Oh, we stopped first in Hawaii to, uh, to uh, talk to people there and then, and then to the Orient. And then we put together what we saw as what the relationship should be. And then uh, uh, I'll just never forget being put into a vault about this size to uh, give a classified briefing, it was two of us giving the briefing, to General Stilwell. And I'll just never forget, he promptly closed his eyes and looked like he fell asleep. And I uh, never had that happen to me before. But I just kept talking, hoping I was doing the right thing, and he and I, my buddy and I, uh, kept exchanging glasses, glances and looking at him as he was just, just like that, oh, oh well. So we continued. And fortunately we did, because he suddenly just raised his eyes and asked some of the toughest questions you could ever imagine. Uh, I never seen anybody do that before, but... Uh, he was thinking he was taking everything in. Oh, looked like he was sound asleep. And he took every word in. Oh yeah, Richard G. Stilwell, I'll never forget him. And, and so that, um, uh, because we began to change in the mid and late 70s, our stance towards China was very much involved with Formosa and the Navy issues and the Philippines and Kuanamatsu and those kinds. So I was very close to those things and all the radio blockings and, and um, all of the <coughs> uh, jurisdictional areas that the Chinese uh, uh, considered theirs <laughs> and, and what was international considerations. And so it was a, you know, it was a lot of picky, picky stuff there. Uh, and, and, it's, and it's become a new trust again. I think it will become even more so in the future. Um, again, again, again. <laughs> uh, so, uh, how? What did you learn from that? Because uh, you've been a, you know, nose to the grindstone type guy, and suddenly you're looking global stuff. Uh, how? Did, how would you contrast that? I mean, here's a here's a guy who's. A well, it was a whole different world, yeah. and uh, I suddenly found myself spending my time with with the army's intellectuals. And. Some of them would do no good with soldiers, I'll just tell you that. But we're just bright as hell if, uh, you know, somebody with a practical touch uh, kept their hand on them. Uh, so that in itself was an education. Uh, it was all highly classified. I, I can't talk about it, but it was, uh, but, it, but that in itself was an education. Understanding, and while I was at the War College, uh, you're given quite a bit of flexibility. And I wanted to learn more about the intelligence community, designed my own study program, and they let me go off and do that as a student. So uh, that was helpful. Um, and then when I, uh, I was due to stay there about another year when again I got a phone call from General Turnage, and he of course had pressed some buttons, but he had taken over as Director of Selective Service and wanted me to come over as Chief of Staff. So that's when I made that move, whole different ball game again. Uh, while I was there, uh, he spent some time with General Thurman, Max Thurman, as did I, another education, uh, to get my first star, which came out of the Army's hide. And I, I still don't know how they worked that, but uh, somebody worked their magic. And, and But General Turnage was, again, another person who had been not pulling strings, but have been kind of directing you. Yeah, um, clearly. And, uh, obviously you'd had two or three very close um, relationships with him. Mm -hmm. uh, how would you describe him now at that position, how he came back as a 
Kremlin is a brigadier, and you know, it's lots changed a lot. Uh, you're a global now. You're a, you're a theorist, as well as a practical person. I mean, you can handle a rifle company as well as uh, we now handle global design on a macro scale. Very different. Um, and, and, and General Turgeon didn't have that capability, but you did. <laughs> well, I wouldn't say he didn't, because I think he did. But <clears throat> what was so nice about working for him is uh, uh, I'd gotten to know him well enough by then that I could think in his absence. And uh, I just can't think of an instance where he uh, uh, over, overturned uh, a decision I made or overruled me. And, uh, and that, that makes it uh, not only good for he and I, but for the people that worked for him. You know, knowing they could go to somebody else and, uh, and uh, get answers. Um, there were some good years. Not only that, but uh, I probably would never have made General Officer if it hadn't been for him. He made that happen. How much he had to do with uh, my second star and going over to the Pentagon as, as uh, executive of the Reserve Force Policy Board, I don't have a clue. But uh, I suspect he was in the thick of that. Well, because your, your, your original work with the PRC would have been a, a big deal. And, and, uh, um, but I don't even know that he knew I did that. Well, I might not have. <coughs> he probably knew that you were doing some work mm -hmm. and the general things. Uh, because when you came back, you worked for, for him for what, two years? About that. And, uh, and, then, and then when I went over into the Pentagon, he was still at Selective Service, stayed there for a while before he took over the Veterans Administration. <clears throat> and uh, and the Pentagon, boy, that that was probably the biggest eye opener of of uh, of all because uh, you've been at the periphery of that with the War College. Yeah, but but uh, when I was in the Reserve Forces Policy Board, I suddenly found myself working with uh, senior flag officers of all the components. Yeah. I was working with. Uh, uh, most often the Assistant Secretary of the Army, Assistant Secretary of the Air Force, and so forth, uh, working with the desk ops of the Army. Uh, Colin Powell at that time, this was during Cap Weinberger's years, he, uh, Colin Powell was his uh, military exec, so uh, I got to know him to some degree. But uh, boy, just suddenly uh, my eyes were open, not only to, the, to all of that, but uh, Almost the first thing that happened when I reported in, <coughs> excuse me, the chairman of the board was a retired Marine Major General and uh, a very high executive in, uh, in uh, probably the largest transportation company in the world, a guy by the name of Lou Conti. And he said to me, he said, uh, you know, we need to look at the reserve component systems around the world, put together a program to take us around to look at them. And so I did that, you know, arranged for a C-141. We went off and looked at the better reserve components, Israelis, of course, having the best. Mm -hmm. uh, and what an education that was. So not only uh, listening to all these bright people that uh, I was supposed to work with on the board, but uh, then this uh, exposure around the world was uh, educated this country boy, you know, it really, it really was. Well, I have a friend who's chair of that committee now, and uh, uh, I didn't know anything about it. Yeah. And, I, uh, and I, I had known the friend for years and years. I know Al for, since he was 15, 16 or something. And a young kid, you know, he was running. And I'd seen his career in Vietnam and back, and, and when politically we'd both been involved different times in administrations and different times. And, uh, and I heard all the rumors of things, but didn't know anything. And I met him at the Nautilus Convention. And he gives me his card. And I said, hi, Al, how are you doing? This is you know, I'm his chair. I don't know that committee from anything. Oh, it's an important committee. Yeah, it could have been the zoo committee. As far yeah, as I yeah. Uh, but then he asked his uh, staffer, uh, give him my, my cards, I'm out, you know, a little later, and it's Lieutenant General. And I thought, wow, that's a staff. And I thought, now that changed everything. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. And uh, so then I immediately went online and tried to find out about it, and uh, and did, and 
and found the significance of what you're talking about. I had no idea, and I wouldn't know now if I hadn't done that homework. Uh, so that, that Reserve Forces Policy Board is probably one of the most significant boards. Uh, it's been around a long time, and I really had known nothing about it. Uh, it wasn't anywhere in my bailiwick, so <laughs> I wouldn't have known it. Uh, but that responsibility, especially researching um, reserve components in other nations to uh, contrast, compare, and take the best. Um, you put together that trip. How, how did that begin to change your, your you were the philosophical in the macro thing with the PRC issue. Now you're in the real life, real life stuff. How, how did that really begin to contrast for you? Um, well, it was, it was, it, you? well, it greatly broadened my outlook. Uh, for, this is the first time where I'm doing joint work, you know, the other services. Because yeah. I had to be very even-handed working with all of the all of the services, and then uh, not only uh, all of ours, but then uh, heading over uh, to look at others, uh, it was just very, very broadening for me. Uh, great experience. Um, what can I say? I think if I'd been offered anything but command of the division, I, w I would have stayed there as long as I could, just because it was it's a, a, such a great experience, mm -hmm. and in great years. These were the uh, the Reagan years. Mm -hmm. We had money, you know. And now I, I uh, suspect if the board asked for a 141, they may not even get it. Yeah. But in those days, uh, you know, if it made sense, we got it. And those were those were those were the glory years for for the military. I agree with uh, all the, we're still living on all of those uh, all that research is done. I know that I've spoken to General Sullivan about some of those things. That that was a time when when uh, uh, a lot of the military planning implementation that we're living with today was done. Mm -hmm. uh, and so what's instrumental, that it, it's kind of a 10-year cycle or so. Um, that is maybe longer. <laughs> some, of the, some of the ships are older than the people that are on. <laughs> I also was working for a Maverick, uh, and uh, we had a new uh, Assistant Secretary of Defense for Reserve Affairs, Jim Webb, a very interesting guy. But in any event, we were, we were trying some things. We did what we called a force mix study, which was looking at how much more inexpensive the reserve components were compared to the active and came up with a, uh, a bunch of uh, uh, mathematical uh, computations to actually do those measurements. Very controversial, uh, and it was suppressed, and I understand why, but nonetheless, uh, very controversial. Uh, that was uh, when uh, the total force concept later became total force policy uh, came to fruition. So all these things were going on around us and uh, great education. Yeah, I don't think many people really know the significance of that book. Uh, I certainly didn't. It was a real eye-opener for me. Yeah. It took me weeks to do all the research. It was actually a child of Congress, and you can make of it what you want. Uh, and, and I stretched. Uh, I stretched the boundaries. I stretched them enough where, where I was again called in the hot seat uh, by uh, by Jim Webb. Uh, I don't know if you know Jim Webb. He, later on, Secretary of the Navy, he uh, was a, a Navy, but genuine war hero, Marine, uh, and an amateur boxer. And uh, they were very unhappy with how far I was stretching out the boundaries and uh, called me in and I walked in and uh, there was uh, Jim Webb on one side of the table and he had uh, a lawyer and he had uh, uh, his exec and he had a, uh, a senior consultant all sitting here along the table with Delk on the other side. And uh, they started asking questions and it all had to do with uh, this force mix study. And uh, it, it was interesting. I. Uh, got to that point when I just put my hand up and I said, uh, is this an inquisition? And I was looking right at Jim Webb. And uh, he kind of paused a minute and uh, he said, excuse us. And he took me in another room and uh, we exchanged a few words and uh, he said, why don't you just forget this ever happened? And the next thing I knew, uh, uh, he, he pinned he didn't pin, but he, he put this in, uh, you know, the highest decoration he could give me, 
And uh, I was always intrigued by that experience. Almost as, as you know, the former boxing, he, he could respect somebody who would take him on. And another time when I thought, whoops, maybe this is an ender for you. <laughs> Go back to being a private. Yeah, interesting man. Yeah. Well, it, it was a, um, again, he was probably checking on rumors and all kinds of things. No one knows, really. It's hard to tell. He well, was, I really was fresh in the boundary zone. I knew it. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was doing that with, with uh, General Connie's uh, acquiescence. And... Uh, he may have ended up paying the price because he was replaced. Mm -hmm. I wasn't, but he was. Although he and I have remained friends to this day. Well, these, these are, um, uh, you started adding up. I mean, here's a little a kid from Long Beach climbing global strategy that generations will live with, and we're living with now. You can't talk about it. Um, how does that make you feel? Well, believe it or not, um, the thing that weighs on me the most is is uh, top secret stuff I've been exposed to, and I can't get out of my mind. You know, and a fear that uh, under anesthesia I'll I'll slip something, because there's something you just you just never forget, and. Uh, and uh, that is what weighs on me more than uh, any of the accomplishments. It's uh, some of it I wish I hadn't seen um, because I really do have a great fear of, uh, of blabbing something I shouldn't sometime. Well, I, I think it, uh, it's, it's a weight, obviously a great responsibility. Um, obviously it wouldn't have been shared if you couldn't have it. I wouldn't have given it to you. Um, Again, there's some mentors out there. Mm -hmm. <laughs> God, God bless them. Yeah. <laughs> uh, how how would you, uh, you know, you when you came back now, you've been at the policy board for what three years? I think it was less than three years, probably between two and three. Uh, with now a tremendous appreciation for the military and political mind of this country. Uh, what was your Next responsibility, and how were you tapped for it? That was interesting. I think. Well, I got a phone call uh, asking me if I would like to have command of division. There's not a soldier in the world that's a real soldier who gets a call like that. I mean, I'm, I didn't ask Mama. I didn't do nothing. I said, when? <laughs> and uh, and so uh, back we went. Uh, and, you know, it was uh, another great job. That was moved in Long Beach, Little Sal. Yeah. yeah, it was at Los Al then. Um, interestingly, our very first morning there, uh, at that time we had an Irish setter, uh, we just moved into our house, our first night there, and the bed started to shake. And I thought it was the Irish setter who always slept with us, scratching himself or something against the bed while it was an earthquake. And uh, that was our introduction back to California. The first night. Our, and the next morning I reported in, and there was another big one. And I just walked in the building. I was kind of leaning against the uh, wall of my new office when uh, it did it again. And so uh, for that and a number of other reasons, my first priority was making sure that we were prepared for uh, to properly handle earthquake. And we did a lot of work on uh, uh, making that a center to handle earthquakes in Southern California. Yeah, that's not something when it became the preparedness center. <clears throat> yeah, we really, uh, we really did a lot of work then. Well, still the only one in LA and Orange County, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. And I, I think that's, uh, with those two strips, you know, of course, all the capabilities. We, we did a, Center for Military History did a little uh, historical timeline. Uh, I don't think it was ever published uh, that we did on base from the Navy to Army and, and North. Uh, because I think it was, it was very important, the significance of the base now, um, and, uh, and some of the improvements that have taken place since then, and some of the old buildings, etc. Because um, we were looking for, a, I was at the time I was trying to find a site so we could move a, a, a museum facility down there because it was just 
we need some place in a population center. And, uh, and uh, but that's an, another issue. But when you took over the 40th, and I don't know if you saw this, is a very different uh, role. It's a mechanized unit. Uh, it hadn't been stripped yet. <laughs> that's true. <laughs> this was the glory years. And, and the timing couldn't have been better for me. Now, what do I mean by that? It was the 80s. Uh, we were well funded. My ad assistant division commanders were Danny Hernandez, yeah. who really knew logistics. Mm -hmm. Nobody better for that job. Abe Hawkins yeah. was the assistant division commander for maneuver, who really knew that business. Chief of staff was Guido Portani, yeah. hard, hard nut, great soldier. Uh, I had some outstanding uh, uh, 06s running the brigades. Uh, we had some uh, wonderful challenges going to Korea, and uh, and we were able to do some great stuff. Uh, Temple uh, had suggested to us that uh, uh, you know stretch out there, don't don't keep it down to squad level, get them out there in the field and see what they could do. So we took the entire division out in the field. We uh, did night displacements with river crossings, tough stuff, and. Uh, Troops responded. It was, uh, it was. Those were great years. We had our first war fighter just as I was leaving. Uh, our years in Korea uh, were great experiences for all of our soldiers. We took a couple of hundred each year. We had a relationship with the Fourth Mech, and uh, well, Denny Reimer was the commander, and as you know, he went on to be chief of staff of the Army. A great relationship. Um, fun years. Great I miss people. those. Yeah. Well. well. Guido, one of the facilities commander before he retired, uh, I got to know him. And, uh, and of course, now I, I, I knew Dan Hernandez very well. I got to meet him very well. And we've kept to know him over the years. And, uh, uh, and Pete Gravitt, some of the other stuff in the past, only because we were based there and we got to work together. But uh, wonderful people. Oh, yeah. Absolutely wonderful. And uh, uh, this is an aside, I'll tell you what. I did something, and I stretched just a tish bit. Thought I'd get away with it. <laughs> he does a no-nonsense man. And he has a temper. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And he laid into me something terrible. Yeah. He's a great soldier, just don't piss him off. That's right, and that pissed him off. <laughs> <laughs> and it was really funny. I said, who the hell is this guy? I did my homework after the fact. Should have done it beforehand. <laughs> and uh, did some fast tracking and corrected my mistake. And, uh, and we became fast friends. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but he, he's a. Um, uh, but uh, so when you mentioned someone, I, I got to meet him. I only knew him known by name, and you know maybe in the reception lines, things like that. Didn't really get a chance to get to meet him. Uh, but when I saw the division, uh, that's the first time I'd been aboard as far as uh, eighty three, eighty four, somewhere in there. That's when I first got involved with uh, with the uh, museum and trying to remodel and all. So I, I really was peripheral to all that stuff, very ancillary. But I just got a, a glimpse of what was going on. And I, of course, knew a lot of guys to guard. So that, uh, you know, you, there's some of the people involved in the, in the, uh, the Korean train. And um, then they're all ready to go. <laughs> and, and, uh, and I'll get PO'd now when they don't have those abilities. Well, in those, in those years, we know who we were going to fight for. Yeah. Norm Schwarzkopf was our was the I Corps commander at that time. We knew who we were going to fight for, where we were going to fight, and had a partnership relationship. And, uh, and some of that has died off uh, to our great cost. Yeah, I think so. Well, I think the Chinese are taking advantage of it. Uh, and and, and, I, and I think they, they know a weakness, and they're not dumb. <laughs> and they're going to exploit it as much as they can. Um, and it'll take us a, a while to catch up again, to put it back, if they're ever going to do it. I just know it historically. I read a lot, and and, and so and just talk to wonderful people, such as yourself. And um, you see those things. Uh, but when you took over the division, uh, it wasn't as as well trained and prepared as it could have been. Uh, they're living still on laurels when you left. Really? 
as you look at it, of things that have been done and were implemented during your, your time, uh, it's only, what, two and a half years? It was just about, no, it was just a hair over three. It was just about three years. And uh, that was a real big, big, big difference. Because that impacted the whole thing and the structure. Most of the structure has been changed, though, except when it's stripped it when it did the gate issue. Um, and uh, I guess it's like, yeah, it's another thing. <laughs> uh, when we, when we uh, talk about when, when you went from, from division, you had some other monumental changes when you left the division. Well, when I left the division, I went back up to state. And I will just tell you, anything after commanding a division is downhill. I mean, you know, let's not kid ourselves. Uh, so I, I went up there. Uh, uh, I went up there as a two-star. I uh, bounced up against MRD. Uh, I'm not sure uh, how involved General Jeffords was, but I suspect he was being very helpful. Uh, certainly uh, General Thrasher. Um, they uh, cut some kind of a deal with the Chief of the Bureau and the Secretary of the Army to retain me as a one-star until I attained age 60 and could retire. And then, of course, I retired as a two-star. Uh, but they did that for me. And, and there's something I'd like to mention that made it easy. Uh, uh, General Jeffords, and I had uh, this a moment ago, it was the first time I mentioned his name. General Jeffords uh, and I had done a lot of things together over the years uh, with the CMA and other places. He was a division commander before I was. And uh, because we were simpatico, I didn't walk in the door uh, with a long list of changes. And that's always tough on soldiers when somebody comes in, wants to make their mark, and make a lot of changes. Well, that wasn't necessary. Uh, he already uh, was going the same direction I would have gone. And so uh, it made it an easy transition for me and, uh, and, and more importantly, for, for the soldiers. Well, you got a lot of credit for it. Yeah. Because uh, it, was, it was just being implemented. So everybody, uh, my, my assumption also was that you didn't have them during your, your reign. No, no, no. General Jeffords should get uh, a good deal of credit. Mm -hmm. Well, because the, um, the, the ability to mobilize and provide a center for disaster Theoretical had never been implemented really anywhere. Um, I have to sit in one of the Homeland Defense issues, and, and the theory was what happens at Staples, the, you know, big game, places crammed, and when you suddenly have 10,000 dead bodies to deal with, what yep. do we do? Yeah, and um, uh, how do we handle it? Uh, and it was a decision that no one had really thought through. And it might not just be a bomb, it could be an earthquake. It could be uh, fires and gas leaks and all kinds of complications. And terrorist things are probably minimal in respect to the numbers as far as that's concerned. Uh, but, uh, but when it comes down to push gets to shove, it's really a military issue in many cases because you're only ones large enough to handle mm -hmm. an organization. And, and, uh, and, and I don't see a lot of that training taking place. Well. Uh, they don't realize, I think, how serious it can be. Yes. We had a comparatively small earthquake, uh, Silmar. Mm -hmm. uh, 800 elevators jumped the tracks. Uh, hospital, as you know, collapsed. And that was, that was under a seven. That was a, a six point, I've forgotten what, but it was certainly under a seven. But what if we really had a catastrophic earthquake? Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, it would be a real disaster, and we're not equipped to handle it. That's right. Uh, the infrastructure, moving emergency vehicles from place to place, and, and uh, you know, those joint power agreements that, that aren't signed, that aren't in place, and uh, the joint training. You know, I, I, I go to these things, as, you know, a lot of these uh, things that Chris Cox puts together. Uh, I mean, that General Robacher puts together. And um, do you know Fadi uh, Mismail, Dr. Mismail, who works as this disaster? No. Oh, He's an Israeli and was uh, one of their assault forces. He's a physician and he was director of Homeland Defense for Chris Cox, I mean for Dana Rohrabacher. Mm. And he's been running all of these um, um, programs on Homeland Defense, on, uh, on uh, uh, disaster preparedness, uh, 
oh, a dirty bomb, that shoots a, a biochem warfare, all those kinds of things. And he is, um, and, and so these are the best that the Army and the uh, Navy and the Armed Forces bring to bear as our students and presenters and programs. And there's place and fire, emergency guard, and all that. And, I, and I'm amazed at how little has been done. It shocks the hell out of me. I mean, and, and I'm just amazed. So politically, I pushed the hell out of uh, Chris Fox, who's got strings to money, <laughs> and to Dana and others, uh, because uh, it's got a, we got some spigots here with all kinds of things. And uh, I, I'm just shocked uh, that, that uh, some of the things that have been built, that, that have been built now through John G. Etheridge and yourself, uh, to prepare to build a ground base, to have not been built on, uh, and, and that just really bothers me. Uh, I, whether it's an earthquake or whether it's the, a bomb or whether it's a gas leaks or well, if you oh, have a, if you have a plan, a mature plan to handle a major earthquake, you can handle all kinds just of about other everything. things. Yeah, yeah. and uh, uh, I mean, you can do all the plumes for a dirty bomb and all that stuff, but. The effects of after that <laughs> it is a big deal. Yeah. Uh, and and that, an earthquake can handle most of it, but uh, even then we only have two or three 14s that are biochem stuff. Uh, or we need like 30 or 40. We get two or three teams in Virginia. Oh, hell, we got 10, 20 times that population. <laughs> you know? So uh, it's all relative. Uh, so I, I really am uh, really uh, concerned about it. But um, that's a whole other thing. <laughs> uh, but. Uh, you piqued my answers because I've been so much involved in it, uh, theoretically, obviously. Uh, but, gentlemen, when you, uh, uh, you went back to Sacramento the third or fourth times at OTAC, uh, you're, 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 a, you're almost a guru now uh, among the bureaucrats. And how, how, did, how did that change? Did, now there's 40, as you said, it was all downhill after 40, it got too provision. Uh, it's hard to be it has been uh, when you've had something as great as the 40th. <laughs> you know? uh, how, how do you how do you handle that and still do the job that you? Well, you still got to be professional. Yeah. You know, um, I wasn't having as much fun, mm -hmm. uh, but uh, still, what you're doing is important, and it can have an impact on a lot of soldiers. So you, you, you know, you have to remain professional. Now, what was your official title at that time? Uh, Deputy Agent General Army Division. Uh, the title has since been changed to Commander, California Army National Guard. Mm -hmm. uh, now, the consolidation. Now, of course, there's been a new shift with the consolidation of staffs. Yes. Um, I see that a number of states have already implemented that. So almost about the time it was being talked about, uh, leaner and leaner and all. And I always wonder whether that that is um, just a bureaucratic way to save money, or whether it really achieves something. I don't know. Nor, nor do I do. Nor do we really know what it's going to look like when it's finished. Mm -hmm. I've, or, uh, you know, I've seen many different reorganizations of our headquarters over the years, mm -hmm. because the Adjutant General has a lot of power to do just got that kind of thing. So I'll, I'll be intrigued to see what the what the final design is. Yeah, I think well, on our state it's probably even more important than Iowa. Wyoming, uh, because it could mean the difference of whether people live or die in a major earthquake in San Francisco or LA or any other population center, uh, or even small little bergs. Yeah. I mean, Tehachapi got pretty bad, and, and they were right on the epicenter. <laughs> so um, if something like that could be, uh, the strategy could be very important. Um, with the uh, with, uh, head of the Army, or the National Guard. Now it's a different role. So let me let me, let me digress. So for historic repair, could you explain the differences between Commander of the Army National Guard versus a division head on the 40th um, uh, versus um, oh, like an AG? Well, 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 well first of all, there's 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 two basic differences in general officers. You have general officers of the line. Uh, who in effect can go off to war, and uh, and uh, adjutant general, which uh, at least two positions in the state are are, are AG. 
and uh, and they're more political, and uh, that's understandable. Um, <clears throat> the whole process is different. The education is different. Well, that's like the officers of line, uh, because of the political point, those people would not be mobilized, uh, AG, but the officers of line could be. Uh, could you kind of contrast that? I mean, you, you inferred that, but I'd like to... Well, well, you know, the, the adjutant general has to be responsive to the governor. Yes. And uh, he, he works for the governor. Uh, you know, where at the stroke of a pen or a phone call, you be commander of the division and you're, uh, you're working for the president as your commander in chief and you're part of the army, the chain of command. And uh, so it's an entirely different ball game with, uh, with different rules. And, and, uh, and we all understand that. Uh, most people don't, so that's why I wanted to yeah. have you kind of compare and contrast that. Um, well, particularly, like, you know, I think in, during the Korean War, when the 40th was called up as a unit. Uh, could we kind of mention that uh, versus um, what's been happening now with individuals and smaller units? Worldwide? Yeah, well, there the really, there is not that much difference in what really happened. It's just uh, it's, uh, it's a matter of scale, the size of the unit. Uh, the adjutant general, uh, of course, he's already full time. And uh, he has a responsibility to provide trained, ready units. So, so he does that, provides what uh, support he can in the meantime. Uh, obviously, he has a responsibility to families left behind. He has a responsibility to reconstitute when they come back off active, active duty. So uh, he's got a big role in all this, too. Now, I, I just looked at my watch, and I promised to get you out of here by 5 to 12. It's 7 to 12. Oh, my. Uh, which means I have to close this down. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, so we've got to continue this. <laughs> right? uh, but if I may, let me thank you on behalf of the California State Military Museum and the Military History Educational Project for allowing uh, you to be for one of our first um, efforts to record the history of our uh, uh, of general officers on the California National Guard. And uh, it's a great privilege. Yeah. I thought I knew you. <laughs> and I really am honored to have had a chance to share this information. No, I gotta tell you, you pulled things out of me I haven't thought about in many years, something <laughs> I haven't thought about at all. Well, well, well I'm glad to have helped. I think it's it's a wonderful opportunity, and uh, uh, I like to explore some of the things, and a special one, just on strategy and planning, micro macro. I think it would be a terrific discussion. Maybe bring a couple of other.